So a brief summary of part two of wage labor and capital. So Marx refutes bourgeois economists who think that somehow a rapid increase in productive capital is advantageous for the working class. Uh, you know, in the midst of this economic crisis we're in, uh, we hear politicians all day talking about the need to grow capital, to cut taxes for businesses, to somehow create jobs for the unemployed. And what Marx does in the second half of Wage, Labor, and Capital, and really the entire novel, is that he tears down this logic and exposes the truth that the bourgeois economists never tell you. Okay. So contrary to the economists, capital is not just raw materials, tools, or the instruments of labor, or the means of subsistence. These first three you see uh, have existed long before capitalism. Capital also must consist of the social relations between capitalists and proletarians, the sum of commodities or exchange values, and the dominance of accumulated labor over living labor. Uh, Marx says that these economists who think that capital only consists of those first three listed out are being too simplistic and hide the unique features of how capitalism fundamentally operates. He points out that every society has a certain set of social relations that enter into the mode of production. So what's particularly unique about capital is that it's the bourgeois relation of production which thrives under this certain set of conditions. So uh, to say like what exactly is capital, right? So capital is not just like money. Capital takes on multiple meanings or forms according to Marx. So it's both, capital is both a material object and a social relation in its material form. Capital consists of raw materials like timber, steel, silicon, and the instruments of production, which are like tools, machines, and computers. Uh, raw materials and instruments of production are collectively known as the means of production. So that's the material form of capital. The second part is the social form. So capital is the relation between the owners of the means of production and those who do not own the means of production. So what does that mean? The non-owners are the workers. They have to sell their labor power, uh, their ability to work to the owners, which are the capitalists for a wage. So the capitalist exchanges capital for the labor power from the worker. Uh, and that's the social form of capital. Um, so going back on what capital necessarily consists of, let's start with the fourth bullet point, which is the social relations between capitalists and proletarians. So it's these certain like social relations that fundamentally shape the mode of production. Uh, what does this mean? In other words, it's the relationship between capitalist and wage laborer. And that's what restructures the raw materials, the instruments of labor, and the means of subsistence from feudalism to capitalism. Uh, so like these things that I just listed out, which are the raw materials, the instruments of labor, and the means of subsistence, like they already existed before capitalism, like I said before, but it's the social relations that transform it. So for example, here you can see that a spinning Jenny only becomes capital with, within capitalist relations of production. Under feudalism, a spinning Jenny would not be capital because it needs the social relations between like the relationship between capitalist and wage laborer because feudal relations are entirely different from capitalist ones. Okay, so moreover, what determines these social relations is the historical development of technology, right? The historical development of the means of production. And here Marx gives a really good quote. Does anyone wanna read it? I will. Um, with the discovery of a new instrument of warfare, the firearm, the whole internal organization of the army was necessarily altered. The relations with 
then which individuals compose an army and can work as an army were transformed and the relation of different armies to another was likewise changed. Okay, thank you. So industrial, that what does this mean, right? Industrial capitalism, capitalism itself, right, was not possible without the industrial revolution's technological infrastructure. Because of the industrial revolution, capital became the organizing principle of an economy. So at each point in historical development, the way we evolve and progress into a new economic mode or a new society that organizes production differently is, con is like necessarily contingent on technological innovations. So from slavery to feudalism, from feudalism to capitalism, and from capitalism to communism, right? A prerequisite to communism is capitalism. Um, so it's like we need the prerequisite of the complete technological advancement that capitalism brings forth. So we need capitalism before we can get to communism. Uh, capitalism, what it does right now, it allows us to mass produce food, right? Which, which can end hunger or it can help us mass produce housing, which can, which can end homelessness. So you can produce this massive amount of surplus value, whereas in slavery or feudalism, that was uh, unattainable. All of these things are key to the communist vision. Therefore, it's not like a mere coincidence that feudalism is predominantly agricultural while capitalism is industrial. Okay, so moving on to the fifth and sixth bullet point, the sum of commodities or exchange values and the dominance of accumulated labor over living labor. So what is the difference between accumulated labor and living labor. Direct living labor is that productive effort which is currently being performed by humans, right? It's currently what's going on in the present round of production. It's that process of like people laboring in the present round of production. So living labor are living labor is the actual workers in the business who are currently producing commodities. An example I give here is Sally, the laborer, works to produce a chair, right? That's living labor. She's currently doing that. Um, accumulated labor, on the other hand, is all that present generations have inherited from the work of past generations. And that comes in the form of machinery, tools, transformed materials, technological apparatuses. So what accumulated labor is, is surplus capital accumulated from a previous round of production. So what is this? These are the commodities and the means of production that were previously created by the laborers and thus accumulated by the capitalists. An example I give on this slide is that uh, Greg, the capitalist, sells the chair that Sally makes on the market, right? He then makes that profit in the form of money, which is his surplus capital. This is what accumulated labor is. He then takes this profit in order to buy even more means of production, which are the machinery, tools, and more labor power. Okay, so thus, from that previous slide, wage, labor, and capital represent the relations of production in a capitalist society. What does this mean? It means that raw materials are not always capital. For example, wood only becomes capital when it's used by wage labor to produce a commodity that will then be exchanged on the market for money and then accumulated by the capitalist. However, if the capitalist takes that money, takes that profit, and he blows it all on personal consumption. He blows it on like what a PS5, right? It's no longer capital. If the capitalist does take a portion of that money or the surplus and plows it back into production, i.e. to purchase more raw material, to purchase more instruments of labor and even more labor power, then that portion continues to be capital because he plows it back into production. So if accumulated labor is the surplus capital during the previous round of production, then living labor is what produced 
the said surplus capital I was talking about. So both accumulated and living labor come from the workers. Although the worker creates this surplus capital, the capitalist owns it. Living labor is therefore completely alien to accumulated labor. Why? Because accumulated labor is only regarded as capital brought into the production process by the capitalist. And I'll repeat that, um, accumulated labor is only regarded as capital brought into the production process by the capitalist and not by the worker, even though the worker himself made it. So although capital consists of a sum of commodities or exchange values, not every sum of commodities is capital. So Marx asked this fundamental question, how does a sum of commodities become capital? So the answer is the exchange of living labor is what transforms and augments this existing value. In other words, living labor allows the sum of commodities to become capital because it preserves and multiplies itself through the wage laborer. Thus, capital is dependent on the existence of a class of wage laborers to exploit. If there's no wage laborer, there's no capital. Uh, and you can see in this little like illustration I give, living labor needs to augment the sum of commodities in order for it to become capital. Um, oh, and another quote that Marx gives, does anyone else want to read it other than the first person? I can read it. Thank you. All right, my camera's not on, but um, capital does not consist in the fact that accumulated labor serves living labor as a means for new production. It consists in the fact that living labor serves accumulated labor as the means of preserving and multiplying its exchange value. Okay, that was awesome. Thank you. So let's dissect this quote, right? Capital involves living labor uh, becoming subservient to accumulated labor. So the workers themselves are forced to serve production rather than the production serving the workers. Accumulated labor does not increase the quality of our lives. It doesn't increase the quality of the workers' lives. On the contrary, it does the opposite. Laborers are forced to work in order to augment the existing value and turn it into capital. For who? For the capitalist. So capital involves living labor becoming subservient to accumulated labor. Uh, this is a quick slide. So you can see through this illustration, capitalists exchange a portion of their capital for labor power, while wage laborers exchange full control over their labor power for the means of subsistence. In other words, capitalists buy labor power from the worker in return for wages in which the worker uses his wages for the means of subsistence. And so let's use an example with this weaver. So let's say a weaver receives $1 for a day's work, but the capitalist sells the commodity for $2. A phenomenon takes place which Marx calls consumption in a double manner. So first, that $1 is consumed reproductively for the capitalist, i.e. when the capitalist buys labor power for only $1 from the worker, he creates more value for himself by receiving $2 because he sells the commodity for $2. The worker replaces what the capitalist consumes and the capitalist makes profit, right? And I'll like say that again, the worker replaces what the capitalist consumes and what the capitalist consumes is the labor power. Not only that, but the capitalist makes profit because he sells the commodity for $2. And on the other hand, that $1 is consumed unproductively for the worker because he immediately uses up the means of subsistence. These means of subsistence are perishable and non-generative, unlike labor power. So what does that mean? If the means of subsistence are is like food, then it's perishable. It just like you eat it in a day, right? And you have to constantly go back and keep earning wages to work and therefore surrender yourself to the capitalist. Another small example is um, like a 
actual example is the Matawan Company Towns. So in the early 1900s, there were these company towns where all the workers would live on site and the services and commodities means of subsistence in which the workers needed to live were vertically owned by the company itself. So this includes food, toothbrushes, blankets, etc. They're all Oh, like they're all being sold by the company in which the workers worked for. So the workers, uh, uh, they literally got into gunfight wars with these like guards against like union members. But besides that point, while living in these towns, everything they needed, uh, like toothbrushes and food were upcharged insane prices to where it was basically unaffordable. So when these workers were paid wages by the company, the workers would then pay the company again for the means of subsistence. Because these means of subsistence, like I said earlier, such as food are perishable and deplete immediately, the workers are thus subservient to capital because they have to work again and again to earn more wages and purchase even more means of subsistence. Um, the workers' labor power is generative and can thus be consumed reprodu reproductively by the capitalist, whereas the means of subsistence consumed by the laborer are consumed unproductively. So now we can see that capital presupposes wage labor and vice versa. They're dependent on the other's existence to remain in motion. The worker needs capital just as much as capital needs the worker to exploit his labor power. And the more productive capital increases, the more the bourgeois, bourgeoisie enrich themselves. So um, although capital and wage labor are existentially interdependent. The material interests of each group are diametrically opposed. So what does this mean? The wage laborer can exchange itself for capital only as long as capital increases, therefore enslaving the wage laborer indefinitely. Rapid growth of capital requires um, rapid growth of profits for the capitalist, but profits can only grow rapidly if the price of labor is decreased. The same way that capitalists compete with each other for more productive, cheaper machinery, they will also compete with each other for cheaper and more productive workers. Um, so Marx defines three aspects of wages. The nominal, which is the money price that the worker receives from the capitalist in exchange for their labor power, right? This is the price of labor power. The real wage, which is the price of labor power in relation to the price of the commodity. And the relative wage, which is the share of immediate labor in surplus value in relation to the share that falls on the capitalist. And I'll explain these more in depth on the next slide. So another example, let's say a worker gets paid $10 for a day's work. His nominal wage is $10 or the money price of labor power. Now imagine a bad harvest takes place and now the means of subsistence such as grains, meat and butter rise greatly in price as a result. This means that for the same nominal wage of $10, the worker can only afford to consume a lesser amount of commodities. Thus real wages refers to the effective buying power of wages and his real wage decreases because he can now buy less commodities with the same nominal wage. Um, so now that we know what nominal and real wages are, what is a relative wage? Relative wages are the ratio between profits of the capitalist and the wages of the worker. Going back on this example, if the nominal wage remains $10, but profits keep increasing for the capitalist, then relative wages have gone down. So as long as the capitalist keeps making profit, relative wage, relative wages will always go down. So this guy right here is David. David recently had a growth spurt, good for him, which shot him all the way up to 5'8", uh, making him way taller than the rest of his sixth grader peers, right? So relative to the rest of David's middle school circle, he's considered tall. But how about when we can compare him to Shaquille O'Neal, who's 7'1", or even taller, 
Mr. Yao Ming, who's seven nine. Relative to Yao Ming, David isn't so tall after all, right? Yao Ming seven nine, David's five eight. It's not adding up. D David's not tall. Even if David's height personally increased, his height is still short relative to these basketball players. Um, so how does this relate to wages? Although a worker's real wage may rise, relative wages will always fall in relation to the capitalist because the extra breadcrumbs earned by the worker in relation to that gigantic loaf of delicious like H Mart 85 bread profited by the capitalist defines the lack of power of the worker. It further defines the worker's subordination in society and exacerbates the power of the capitalist, right? So as long as the capitalist keeps making profit, it means that his hold and his like chokehold over the worker, it will become stronger and stronger. Uh, Marx has this really good like saying, and he says that our desires and pleasures are measured in relation to society, not the objects which give us gratification. So because of this, the worker ultimately feels poorer because the level of inequality rapidly increases. This is why some theories today, such as trickle down economics do not work. So what trickle down economics says is that if you give billionaires more and more money, they'll create more jobs. If only billionaires could get more tax cuts and have things like healthcare privatized, they'll make more money and it'll eventually trickle down to ordinary people like us. And woohoo, we'll solve unemployment, we'll solve homelessness and we'll solve hunger. But in reality, capitalists accumulate capital at a disproportionately faster rate and barely leave anything for the working class. So yay, on to the next chapter, the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages. So this chapter is about capitalist preoccupation with surplus and surplus only. Given this single goal, the capitalist is driven to sell more and more commodities. So the selling price of commodity, commodities in the capitalist point of view consists of three parts. Number one, the price of replacements of raw materials and upkeep on machines. What is this? So the capitalist needs to replace the cost of raw materials and means of production. So this replaces the previously existing value. Number two, the price of wages. The capitalist also needs to replace the wages advanced to the worker. And this comes from the surplus value that the worker has created through their labor power. Number three, the amount of profit. Lastly, um, the capitalist needs to have as much and much surplus or profit left over after the first and second bullet points that I gave earlier. This amount also comes from the surplus value that the worker has created. So note that only the second and third, the price of wages and the amount of profit are new values created in production. The first, which is the price of replacements of raw materials and upkeep on machines are merely replacing what already existed. So now going back to nominal, real and relative wages, Marx gives us an example. If nominal wages fall one third, so let's say from $3 to $2, but the means of subsistence has fallen two thirds, let's say from $3 to $1. Uh, although the worker can buy more commodities than he could before because real wages have gone up, right? His effective buying power has gone up and he can buy more things. The relative wage actually goes down. But why is that? This is because the worker's nominal wage decreased while the amount of profit gained by the capitalist increased. In other words, since the capitalist pays the worker $1 less, he in turn profits $1 more because the cost of labor is cheaper. Even though the worker gets paid less, he's still expected to do the same amount of labor. So Marx then asks, what determines the rise and fall of wages and profit? And then last, he answers his own question with this lovely quote, 
Does anyone want to read this one? I'll read it. <clears throat> they stand in inverse proportion to their the share of profit increases in the same proportion in which the share of labor wages falls and vice versa. Profit rises in the same degree in which wages fall. It falls in the same degree in which Thank you, that was fantastic. So thus the profit of the capitalist is directly and structurally tied to the wage of the worker. So if relative wages decrease, then profits increase. The share of profit increases in the same way that the share of wages decrease. Capitalists think in the way of constantly increasing their relative profit in relation to the relative wages of the worker. Adding on to this, this means that accumulated labor increases from living labor, meaning that profit grows in proportion in which labor augments capital. Okay, now we reach chapter nine, the interests of capital and wage labor are diametrically opposed. So why do relative wages matter if an increase in real wages, the increase in effective buying power or the increase in how many things you can buy with your wage, right? Why do relative wages matter if an increase in real wages allows you to afford more commodities? Reiterating what I explained on the previous slide, even if real wages do increase, a decrease in relative wages means that the social chasm which divides the worker and the capitalist widens. In other words, this augmentation of capital by the worker indeed allows him to receive a larger amount of crumbs, all the while the capitalist increases the number of slaves dependent upon capital. Therefore, the degree of material inequality between the capitalist and the worker increases, even if the material position of the worker himself has improved. The, in, the increase in material life and well-being does not abolish this antagonism between the worker's interests and the capitalist's interests. His material increase comes at the cost of his social position. So this is why when bourgeois economists say things like, oh, but if the worker gets a pay raise, then isn't that good? It completely disregards what the root of the issue is. It doesn't fundamentally change the antagonistic relation between the worker and capital. It's like saying, hey, slave, hey, wage, wage laborer, you get, to eat better, you get to eat better now, buy better shoes and have a slightly thicker blanket. Do you feel better now, slave? Even if the slave does get a slightly better material position, it doesn't change his structural position. There's still a slave who's dependent on his master. There's still a wage laborer who is dependent on the capitalist class. There's still workers who must sell their labor power in order to live and survive. So when bourgeois economists say that the worker has an interest in the rapid expansion of capital, what they really mean is that A, the more speedily the worker augments the wealth of capital, the larger the amount of crumbs they receive. B, the more number of workers can be employed and therefore exploited in the same manner. And C, the more number of wage slaves will be dependent on and subordinate to capital. Now we can see how this relationship between the capitalist and the wage laborer is inherently contradictory. They're two groups with opposing interests, yet interdependently connected to one another. This is what creates the class antagonism between bour the bourgeois and the pro proletariat, in which wealth of the capitalist rises disproportionately faster and his domination over the proletariat strengthens. And we hear so many politicians say things today like, Today in capitalism, people in general have more access to food and water, better living conditions and a higher life expectancy, which is why capitalism is good. However, this is not a case for capitalism. An American slave who lived in the 1800s undoubtedly had better living conditions than a slave living in the 1700s, but is that a case for slavery? No, and it's the exact same for capitalism. There are workers who are making a bit more than they 
used to in the global south than they did before, sure. But these slight improvements in standards of living are certainly not sound justifications for capitalism. But the root of the issue is, is the structural relationship between wage laborer and capitalist. Not that the workers should be getting paid $7 instead of six. This is what socialists and communists identify as the problem with capitalism. Not that capitalists should be a little kinder when they're exploiting their workers. So Marx asks us again, in what manner does the growth of productive capital affect wages? So when productive capital grows, so do the number of individual capitalists. This means that there is greater intra-competition among the capitalist class. And in order to survive, they have to increase their share of the market by selling goods cheaper than their competitors. But how do they do this? They do this by decreasing the cost of production. So let's use an example with Mr. Bill Gates. In order for Bill Gates to decrease the cost of production, he replaces labor power with new machines and he increases the division of labor. So what is the division of labor? The division of labor means, what this means is that workers are now assigned to specific tasks in the manufacturing process to improve efficiency. A classic example uh, is the Ford Motor Factories in the 1920s, Henry Ford made use of the assembly line to increase the productivity of producing motor cars. On the assembly line, there was a division of labor with workers concentrating on particular jobs. So what this increased division of labor does is make it so that one worker is able to produce what used to take five workers. So after Bill replaces labor power with the new machines and increases the division of labor, he says to himself, how genius of me to decrease the cost of production by sacrificing my workers. Now, Bill is able to sell commodities at a lower price than his competitors and thus drive him out of the market. He's a complete genius. However, Bill's competitors will eventually catch on and reduce their cost of production through the exact same process that Bill used. Thus, the average price of the commodity is lowered not only below its old, but also below its new cost of production. Um, and I'll repeat this, the average price of the commodity is lowered both below its, both below its old, cost of production and the new cost of production. So the effects of such competition around productivity on the capitalist class is the need to have more and more markets since now each commodity is sold for less because of the large scale production. There's the need to outweigh the lower selling price by increasing the quantity of sale to replace the cost of production. Now, I wanna congratulate all of you for staying this long for the final chapter of Wage, Labor, and Capital. Effect of capitalist competition on the capitalist class, the middle class, and the working class. So this increase in the division of labor and newer, more efficient machinery has a few implications. And by a few, I mean a lot, and six of them. So number one, the increased division of labor makes it so that one worker can do what used to take many workers. Fewer workers are needed for the same output of a product. Thus, competition between workers increase, and they're also compelled to sell their labor cheaper than the other and be more productive than the other. Number two, labor is both simplified and cheapened. Machines easily replace skilled workers, making the demand for unskilled labor rise while the demand for skilled labor fall. Special skills become absolutely worthless through increased use of machinery. Um, because it's cheaper and easier for workers to learn work, the cost of production decreases for the capitalist. And so the wages of the worker will decrease as a result as well. And number three, even more competition increases 
as the petty bourgeois fall to the working class, which is called proletarianization of the middle class. So these are the small scale industrialists who can't compete with the larger, more efficient industrialists, as well as the small scale shopkeepers who are unable to compete with the large scale ones. This is because there is an incentive for capitalists to monopolize and kick out competitors in the market. Success in the industry is not this uh, like pluralistic field of competition where firms are harmonious and work together. No, they're all hungry for capital and they want to do anything it takes to make the most surplus they can get. Number four, the increased use of machinery. So when one worker gets displaced by a machine, it's more likely that in their next job, they will get paid less than their former job. Competition with machines decrease the workers' wages. Uh, number five, to make the same amount of wages as before, the worker needs to be much more productive than before and work more hours. Essentially, the worker is competing against themselves as a member of the working class. Uh, lastly, thank God, number six, the wages that one person used to make are no longer enough to support the household. So more members of the family are now drawn into the labor force, including women and children. And now it takes three to four workers in a household to support the household, or in other words, to make the same wages that previously one worker could have made. Yes, big head marks here. Does anyone want to read this quote? I'll read it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, but capital is not, the capital not only lives upon labor. Like a master at once distinguished and barbarous, it drags with it into its grave the corpses of its slaves, whose <clears throat> hecatombs of workers who perish in the crises. Uh, we thus see that if capital grows rapidly, competition among the workers grows with even greater rapidity, i.e. the means of employment and subsistence for the working class decrease in proportion even more rapidly. Okay, thank you. So, re like, what does this quote mean? So this causes a crisis of overproduction as capital viciously expands, the size of the market must expand, but laborers can't afford to buy commodities if their wages are cut. Each time a new market is exploited to accommodate the increase in the productive power of labor, there's one less market to exploit for when the next crisis develops. Capital lives on labor and feeds on it, and there's no way out of this cycle because the capitalist system itself is unsustainable and contradictory. The only means whereby crises are overcome merely lay the basis for the next crisis to be even bigger. Uh, so this is also called anarchy of the market. The anarchy of the market is when the market's own contradictions and conflicts lead to periodic crisis. The crisis of overproduction is a result of producing for the sole goal to accumulate profit rather than a rational allocation of resources. The social problems arise out of this market failure and the working class suffers. Unemployment, loss of homes, social problems like crime, drug abuse, and poverty. Capitalism periodically moves through this crisis, depression, revival, boom, and then crisis all over again. Okay, so last slide. And now that we've reached the end, why is this a case for socialism? Marx shows us how capitalism sucks on the productive power of laborers in order to sustain itself. There's but a bleak future for the working class in the world of capitalism. When economists say that the rapid increase of capital is somehow good for everyone, it's clear how capital destroys democracy while claiming to spread it throughout the world. To put it simply, capitalism fails to meet the needs of all of society. Socialism intends for the workers themselves to own the means of production instead of the capitalists. Only in this way can we create a true democratic future where people can create meaningful, joyful, creative work. 
rather than being chained down by the grips of the capitalist class, we can cooperate collectively and prioritize the people's well-being rather than the capitalist precious profit. And that's the end of the presentation. And I'll be sending in some discussion questions if needed, but if anyone, like, feel free to just unmic and say any comments you had or questions you had. So I have a question. Um, 